Melbourne. It's probably just about as far away as where I come from as to where I could ever go to. Uh, and I suppose we have this idea of postcards that you would send something home or receive something from home. So it's a very personal exhibition in the fact that this room that we're sitting in, there are 180 photographs, there are 180 mirrors, but the way that everything is installed, there are reflections of reflections upon reflection and so on that you really literally are lost. If we say that the only way in is the only way out, we set up some kind of a conundrum, you know, the, obviously the labyrinth, the maze, whether you're conscious of it or not, and that every step you take might be one that you'll make again. It was unusual for me to have this kind of gift of that type of game in a public uh, scenario. It reveals a lot about my influence from conceptual art, where there really is not so much of a beginning or an ending, or even a middle point, which of course is a kind of a reference to Jean-Luc Godard, where he says, you know, every, every story has a beginning, a middle and an end, but it's not necessarily in that order. And I wanted that disorder here. I think that the show begins 50 meters before you see the first work. The first part of the work you encounter would be the sound coming from between darkness and light and the sound is critical to it and the confusion is a paramount element to how to address the whole exhibition. You kind of don't wander innocently into between darkness and light. You're seduced into it. I'd had this idea that I'd like to see two things at the same time. Now, this may not seem so uh, important or so physically impossible now that we are living in the 21st century, but remember this was in the 20th century and it was not easy to do that. You had The Exorcist. I rammed it into the Song of Bernadette. I mean, you know, basically the same story, the possession of a young woman by different spirits. Between Darkness and Light would be a very honest way for me to propel the rest of this stuff into the experience of the viewer. The first visual work is on the other side of the first wall that you will see. And there's a significant absence on the side of the wall that you see that might just encourage you to go around the back. Maybe. It's difficult to tell. Almost everything in this room is a documentary truth. It's not necessary for everyone else to know who these characters are. What's really interesting to me about portraiture and self-portraiture is if you call something a portrait and you have a figure in front of it, whether a screen, like a cinema screen, or whether it is a canvas, do you or I stand in front of a Goya painting, a Velázquez painting? Do we think about the Duchess of Alba? Do we think about the artist who was holding the brush? Or do we think about ourselves? It's a mirror upon a mirror with another mirror and maybe some decent lighting involved in it. When I started to think about these uh, metaphors for one's reflection on oneself, I took it to as literal and as extreme as I could. I can't look at my grandmother and grandfather without seeing myself. I can't look at 
the mother of my son without seeing myself. I can't look at the mother of my daughter without seeing myself. I can't look at Zinedine Zidane without seeing myself. The phrase, I suppose, in English would be Hall of Mirrors. And the space behind this one that we're talking in now, a piece called Through a Looking Glass, which I think I first presented in New York. I think it was in 1999. Uh, and it's normally just a, just a double projection. It's already confusing enough. And we were lucky enough to have uh, a good enough uh, arsenal of equipment here that we could make a different version of it. I don't think this is such a big deal for a generation like mine who work with sampling and remixing. I, uh, that's part of the music culture and the film culture and the online culture that we have grown up with. Well, I'm the only one here. The installation of you know pretty much every film and video, etc. A lot of that work was kidnapping, quoting or referencing work from cinema. The pictures you know, still hold a fascination for me. This cross-referential, cross-pollination aesthetic is very important. Being able to mix languages is something that I always desired. I don't know whether this is a purely autobiographical issue for me, but there's a drive to be understood. And maybe part of the drive is to do with my desire to choose what I would say are, on the one hand, common denominators, but common denominators like Psycho, The Exorcist and Taxi Driver, were also forbidden for me. So if I'm forbidden my common denominator, wouldn't it be obvious that I drift towards them and I actively pursue working with those images, those narratives, to get lost again. Thirty-second text is really only to do with... Do you have a watch? Yep. Can I have it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, Twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. 